von der Leyen asked Serbia to agree on foreign affairs as she tours Western Balkans promoting EU enlargement. The President of the European Parliament, Roberta Metzola, met with the Pope and praised his work in promoting reconciliation and peace. Weekend elections in Georgia could decide the future of the country and whether it ultimately joins the European Union. The wine-growing town of Konyak is at the epicenter of a trade war between China and the EU. Ursula von der Leyen and her Balkan tour land in Serbia, one of the EU candidates with which the relationship is more complicated. One of the reasons is the lack of support from its president Aleksandr Vucic for the bloc's sanctions against Russia. Serbia, of course, the president von der Leyen wanted to have much more agreement with the declaration of the European Union, the agreement with some other questions. And we don't say anything when we talk about it between ourselves. Serbia wants to join the EU, but in order for that to happen, it must enact a few reforms. The EU Commission president says the country has made progress. And you have shown that deeds follow your words. And it is in this spirit that we are working together on the opening of the Cluster 3. There is not set year for Serbia to join the EU, but recently Vucic said it would be difficult that it happens before 2028. During his visit to New Delhi, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz spoke with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and endorsed a free trade agreement between India and the European Union. Scholz and Modi also signed agreements on increased cooperation between Germany and India as it comes at a time when the West is seeking to counter China's growing influence in the region. Als Bundeskanzler setze ich mich insbesondere für ein ehrgeiziges Freihandelsabkommen zwischen Indien und der Europäischen Union ein. Davon würden alle Seiten wirklich profitieren und es sollte unser Ehrgeiz sein, hier endlich voranzukommen. And on the topic of Russia's war in Ukraine, Schultz said it impacts both Germany and India in various ways and that no one can close their eyes to the conflict. Daher befürworte ich es ausdrücklich, dass Indien für einen dauerhaften und gerechten Frieden eintritt. Und ich freue mich über die Bereitschaft, die verlässlichen Beziehungen zu allen Parteien zu nutzen, um zu einer politischen Lösung des Konfliktes beizutragen. Scholz considers the achievement of peace a precondition for Ukraine to become a member of NATO. He spoke about Ukraine's peace plan a day prior to meeting Modi and voiced his concern over Ukraine's request for an immediate invitation to the alliance. He said a country at war cannot become a member of NATO. During a meeting at the Vatican, the President of the European Parliament, Roberto Metzola, praised Pope Francis for his leadership in promoting reconciliation and peace. Metzola emphasized humanity and peace are similarly at the heart of the European Parliament's work and reiterated the European Union's commitment to its role as a peace project. The Pope held a private audience where he discussed main topics on the European agenda with Metzola. On Ukraine, the President of the European Parliament said that the European Union will continue to support Ukraine from Russia's unjustified aggression. The pair also spoke about migration, to which Metzola said there is a need for a European and human-centric approach, one that does not leave any country or individual unsupported. When speaking about the Middle East, Metzola reassured the Pope that Europe continues its efforts to de-escalate the situation and said they need to find a sustainable way forward towards long-term peace. Lithuania will continue to be a responsible partner of the European Union and Ukraine if the center-left form a new government. 
That is according to the former Lithuanian president, Dalia Gribuskaite. Yes, it is a large uh, probability that we will have now center-left uh, government. But from foreign policy point of view, I do not see at all any um, serious changes. It will be continuity, uh, responsible behavior towards our partners, uh, pro-European stance, uh, pro-NATO stance, pro-Ukrainian stance. National security has become a main talking point leading up to the country's elections. To the former head of state of the country, a peace agreement in Ukraine that allows Russia to keep the territories conquered as Vladimir Putin intends will only give room for Russia to prepare for new aggressions to other neighboring countries such as the Baltic states. It's not necessarily Baltic states, it could be also Moldova, it could be uh, even Georgia, it depends on elections also. So from this point of view, uh, Putin's Russia today is dangerous neighbor. It's not just Russia, but Putin's Russia. And especially because then Putin started open war, open war towards its neighbors, he has no way back. And until the end of his time, he will be in the war mood, and that means uh, in the more intensive war mood or less intensive, he will be always dangerous to the European Union and to its neighbors. Kiribuskaite was in Portugal for the Estoril conferences, where she participated in a panel on diplomacy and international cooperation with the former head of state of Mongolia and the former prime minister of Tunisia. Georgia is heading to the polls on Saturday in a parliamentary election many citizens believe will be the most crucial vote of their lifetimes. The election will pit a coalition of opposition parties against the ruling Georgian dream, which many fear is dragging the nation towards authoritarianism and away from the European Union. Brussels put Georgia's bid for entry to the EU on hold indefinitely in August after the ruling government passed a Russian law cracking down on freedom of speech earlier this year. Georgian Dream argue it needed to curb harmful foreign actors trying to destabilize the country. But journalists and activists say its true goal is to stigmatize them and restrict debate before the election. Many Georgians fear that if the Georgian Dream Party is re-elected, hopes of joining the EU could be permanently extinguished. This year, an election year, the funds allocated by the European Parliament to the political groups represented in it were paid out on a half-yearly basis rather than annually. The June election was a game-changer, with some mostly right-wing groups winning seats in the chamber and others losing, such as the Greens and the Liberals of the Renew Group. The bulk of these funds is distributed in proportion to the number of MEPs in the group. During the six-month period, the European Parliament has paid out 31 million euros to the seven political groups and to non-attached members. The European People's Party, as the biggest group, received more than 8 million euros. The Social Democrats received almost 6 million and the far-right Patriots for Europe received 3.7 million. At the bottom of the scale, the Europe of Sovereign Nations group, which has 25 MEPs, received 1.17 million euros. The European Parliament allocates around 65 million euros a year for the support of the political groups. Most of it is distributed proportionally, so 97.5%. 2.5% uh, is distributed in equal shares, but the bulk is distributed in proportion to the, the number of members of European Parliament that the political group has. So bigger groups get more funding, smaller groups get less funding. The European Parliament's budget is the only source of funding for political groups and non-attached members. The funds are used to cover administrative and operational costs. They explicitly cannot be used to support national political parties or to finance election campaigns. We need to massively invest However, the funds have been misused in the past and Parliament was forced to implement stricter controls. In Denmark, the Danish People's Party has used this group funding to support the Facebook campaigns in the run-up to the Danish election, the Danish national elections. There have also been similar cases in France, for example, with the, the Front National back then, so it's quite some time ago, huh, where group funding was also misused uh, for the purpose of the national party and national candidates.
Other funds from the European Parliament are paid directly to MEPs in order to pay their assistance salaries. The wine-growing town of Cognac in southwestern France is at the epicenter of a trade war between China and the EU. Since mid-October, Beijing has imposed temporary anti-dumping measures for imports of European brandy. This comes after the EU Commission said it wants to impose heavy tariffs on electric vehicles coming from China. Anxiety and frustration against the French government are brewing among cognac makers. Nous sommes pris en otage une situation dans le cadre d'un conflit entre l'Europe et la Chine sur les véhicules électriques. Cognac n'y est strictement pour rien, on est complètement sacrifié. Donc on peut encore rattraper la situation. Il en va de notre gouvernement de trouver des solutions, de se rapprocher de la Chine et de voir quelles discussions il peut y avoir hors, hors Europe. Je rappellerai que la Chine, c'est notre premier marché en valeur, j'insiste beaucoup, notre deuxième en volume. France est expected to be the country most affected by this decision, with China importing as much as 99% of the spirit last year. That's about 1 billion euros in revenue. In addition to bad weather and harvest this year, cognac makers fear this decision could threaten the future of their profession. Venir ajouter ce sujet des taxes chinoises qui nous ferait perdre notre deuxième marché, ça entraînerait des conséquences catastrophiques pour tous les opérateurs, viticulteurs, négociants et toute la filière qu'il y a autour de nous. European brandies such as Armagnac, Italian Grappa and all other grape spirits will also be overtaxed by China. Euro News. The News.